Okay. Okay, I'm recording to the cloud. We'll see if I can get it later. Um, so they said, well, that's a pineapple tasting vine and they would go out and collect all the budwood from that one. And then we'd just use those vines and we could make pineapple squared and pineapple cubed or whatever. And we could collect for whatever character we wanted, pineapple, muscati, apples, pears, you know, any sort of fruit character that we wanted. So everything was really cool. And that's why California Chardonnay was really cool until 1989 when we got phylloxera and we discovered that the rootstock that we were using was actually not resistant. The French had told another story. You know what the French are like. Any story is a good story. You know how the, you know how the Americans salute, right? You know how the British salute? You know how the French salute? You know how the, you know how the Australians salute? Because of all the flies. Anyway, so, um, so we, we, we had to use Vitis Labrasca, which is another, which is another type of Vitis, which we knew, which we thought AXR1 was. And when we use Vitis Labrasca and put our field selections or mass selections on top, we've got a massive problem. We've got leaf roll, leaf curl, stem pitting, corky bark, the yields went down, vines were dying, it wasn't working. And so that's when they created a thing called a clone. So a clone is they went into the vineyard and they found one vine that didn't show any virus for whatever reason that was. And the other way to do it was they could take a leaf, they slit the veins on the leaf and they put it on an agar plate and they grow the vine, they take the tip, they grow the vine, they take the tip, they grow the vine. And what they're doing is outgrowing the virus. And uh, you put that on the new rootstock and voila, no virus. The problem is today, the definition of a clone, I know this is hard for some of you guys because you guys live up in the frozen fields, is that you need to know who your parents are. All right, that's what a clone is. A clone is you know who your mother is. That's the definition. I prefer the mass selections and the field selections because clones, if somebody comes up to me again and says, dude, your Chardonnay tastes like white peaches and stone, and, uh, or stone fruit and pit fruit. That's like every goddamn Chardonnay in the world. Because today, everything is made from clones. The definition of a clone is it tastes the same. And that's why Chardonnay is not very interesting for me. And so when, when uh, my team said, oh, you know, we need to make a Chardonnay, I'm like, well, dude, you know, I have to find a vineyard that hadn't been replanted. So this vineyard was never replanted. It's still on AXR1. It's a mass selection. I'm going to show you a little uh, a style chart here. Um, if I can do that. So this... Uh, let me show you. This is what's key. This is why this vineyard has survived because the soil is a Goldridge sandy loam. So it's like a talcum powder soil. This is a mass selection. This is a cluster of a mass selection. If it was a, if it was a clone, all the berries would be the same color, color um, size and it'd be super big. And this vineyard is old. And we all talk about old vine Zinfandel and sometimes we talk about old vine Cabernet, but this is old vine Chardonnay. And so stylistically today, if you were to think of pineapple, melon, stone fruit, pit fruit, citrus, and grassy, you know, going from warm fruit to cool fruit. And the other two terms we use are structure and texture. So a structural wine is a wine, if you look at me, if a structural wine is a wine that comes in the mouth like this. Things that make a wine structural are acid, CO carbon dioxide, the temperature you serve the wine at. Um, they're all trying to make the wine structural. A textural wine is a wine that does this. So it's broad on the entry and broad on the finish. Things that make a wine textural are high pH, alcohol, fruit, malolactic and things like that. So that's what traditionally Chardonnay is today. But what you're trying is singing tree and you're gonna have more of this, what we call melon, and you're gonna have a little bit more structure because I make this wine a little bit I put about 40 to 50 percent of it in concrete in any particular year and so it keeps that wine light and lively and mineral and really easy to go back and have that second glass so that's where we are um i'm just going to show you picking chardonnay out here in the russian river today the guys are sorting through it beautiful uh, beautiful little vineyard we're just wrapping up here and should get this fruit into the vineyard at the winery in the next uh, hour or so It'd be fantastic this is some of the best chardonnay that we make and uh, you can see we've got big berries and small berries hanging in, in the same cluster. And this is what mass selection uh, Chardonnay is all about. It's beautiful, beautiful fruit. Little uh, melon and, and 
and uh, sub subtropical characters will come from this. Fantastic. No clones here, no clones. Yeah, so that's just a little bit about Chardonnay and the, um, you can buy it today. Uh, these guys are selling it for 1950 out in California. It's usually about 24, 25 bucks for a single vineyard, Russian river Chardonnay is pretty unheard of to get anything under 20 bucks, um, for Chardonnay. Well, from Russian river anyway. Do you guys, do you guys like this? I like to, I like to say it's not your mother-in-law Chardonnay. That's uh, so sugary and oaky. This is kind of like your, your good everyday fresh fruit. And that's what Nick's trying to capture, not kill it with oak so you can actually taste the nice fresh fruit. So this, even the Saab Blanc drinkers and the anti-Chardonnay peeps actually like this wine. So hope you enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, it's been really popular with people that don't like Chardonnay. Look, Chardonnay is the number one grape in the US. Doesn't matter what you think. And it's still growing at three to 4% a year off the biggest base. People are still drinking Chardonnay. The problem yeah. is they're drinking sameness. It's all the same. And so that's why I find Chardonnay a little bit boring. And that's why I think this one's a little bit unique. Tell the label's really- The name, how did you get the yeah. name? So the label's, the label's really cool too. So in November, December, when we're all uh, trying to hunker down after the vintage, the, um, the birds squawk like crazy in my trees outside. And they're all these little black starlings. So instead of calling it the squawking tree, we call it the singing tree. That's where the name comes from. Anyway. Susan helped design the label, so there you go. She's part of the team. Yeah. Um, what else can I tell you? Or should we move on to savvy? Let's let's do the savvy. I think. D does everybody know what where Nick? So he's from New Zealand. He was a CME winemaker for what fourteen years, and then he went on to be VP of wine for Beam Wine Estates for six years. So our company's only been around what since nineteen. How long, Nick? 2009, 2008? 2008. 2008. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's kind of neat because we're just kind of at the, the beginning of a Mondavi type of thing. And here's some of the family here he's showing you in the photo there. Do you want to explain this, Nick? Yeah, so in Healdsburg, they've run a, uh, we're a very small town. We only have 9,000 people. And so they did a, uh, a front porch. They went around. This is us sipping in place. So that's uh, what I've been doing is drinking wine in painting rooms. And my daughter who, uh, that's Hillary, she's, um, she's a senior. She's gonna go to UC Davis in uh, chemical engineering, but that's, that's the only time she can wear a prom dress because she never went to prom. And my son who's at UNR, University of Reno, so they closed up early and so he came home too. So he's been playing uh, video games. That's my wife working diligently all the time. Um, so I'm from New Zealand, I'm from right up here. I'm from uh, Mangafai, which is up here. The biggest city in New Zealand is Auckland. The capital is Wellington. And uh, the vineyards that we own are here in Marlborough. So this is one of the most treacherous uh, flight paths in the world. The wind comes through what's called Cook Strait. It's amazing. The aeroplanes fly super high to, uh, to avoid the wind. So it's, it's a really interesting flight. Uh, and uh, yeah, big rugby. I don't know if you guys know this, man, but there's a big rugby game tonight. It's full stadium, 80,000 people because New Zealand has no COVID. Uh, we, have, we, uh, we, played, uh, we played Wellington last weekend. We thrashed them. And now we're going to be playing Hamilton uh, tonight. At midnight, I'll be watching the rugby. Anyway, so um, it's, this is Blenheim. So there's three valleys. There's the Wairau Valley, the Albuquerque Valley, and uh, the ward, which we don't care about ward. And we are in the Wairau Valley. This is the traditional area. We're very close to a town called Renwick. The vineyard we're gonna talk about tonight comes from right here. This is the Fitzroy vineyard. Our other vineyard is, is over here on the, on the Brancot. Uh, these, this is the, this, it's very interesting. All the roads run east-west. So this is Rapara, uh, this is Rapara Road. This is, uh, New, new Renwick, Middle Renwick, and Old Renwick Road. So you never get lost. <laughs> but a lot of these small roads run north-south. And so we're on a road called, we're just near Jackson's Road. This is Jackson's Road here. Uh, this is uh, Cloudy Bay, Alan Scott, uh, Martua Vineyard called Paratai. If you know Paratai, they're high in wine. And then this is Stonely, and then us. And this is the vineyard that we're talking about, is this one right here. Um, and uh, this is the vineyard getting picked. We picked on April 4th, 2020, which was pretty early. 
for the 2020 vintage, but uh, we had beautiful weather, no rain, and uh, this is a really cool video. I love this. Here we are at the Fitzroy Vineyard, just driving down the uh, road. This is the way we do it in New Zealand. We make our roads just wide enough for our rental cars to fit down. You can see we're not quite ready yet. We've still got outside of and yeah, so uh, it's pretty funny in some vineyards now that every tenth or point to row a little bit wider so you can ride your, ride, drive your rental cars down because everything is uh, machine um, machine uh, harvested, machine pruned, etc. So this is the wine that we're trying. So there's a couple of things about this is um, we don't the big thing is we don't sell it to the British because the British drink most of the Sauvignon Blanc. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a big fan of British food. So, uh, I mean, there's only so many fish and chips you can eat in your life. And uh, we eat Mediterranean food in the US. So what I choose to do with this is I want to have the wine. So New, Ze New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is usually a wine like this. And th the key thing for wine with me is, and it, when I was making wine in Portugal back in, uh, with, when I was, you know, when I was running LVM Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton owned wineries too, like Cloudy Bay, Cape Mantel, Rafino, Terrasas, and Portugal, they own roses. So I'm in roses. This is, this is the one, I'll share one story tonight. So um, I'm with three Portuguese winemakers and they all drink port. And I don't know if you know this, but everyone's really skinny in Portugal. It's not because the, it's not because the economy sucks, it's because the food is really hard to eat. They eat these things called barnacles, they're about this long, right? You get three of them, it's 110 degrees and you're drinking port. Anyway, so I said to the lady in the restaurant, I said, ma'am, could I get a glass of white wine? Immediately the winemakers ate, Nick, we don't make white wine in Portugal. Anyway, the lady comes in and goes, don't worry, ma'am, uh, guy, I'll take care of that. She fills it up like my mother-in-law, right up to here. Condensation's pouring off it. It's 110 degrees, I'm eating barnacles. I get this wine, I go, shit. All the enamel on my teeth is gone, the roof of my mouth is gone, what the hell is that? But I didn't know what a Vene Verde was, but it's the sensation of that. I have this distinct memory about wine because when I, fit, when I stop, I'm like, shoot, am I hungry or thirsty? And that's the key thing about wine. I can sell any of you guys one glass of wine. It could be the worst wine I've ever made in my life, but you'll buy it once. But will you drink it twice? And that's the key. So with this Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, so um, I try to make this wine more in a Mediterranean style. So it's your classic New Zealand stuff is really, sorry, kids having fun. There's a, it's really um, grassy and asparagus and, and, you know, sometimes it's too acidic for me, but because we don't sell it to the British, I make it a little bit rounder. So I leave it on the leaves. I leave it on the juice leaves, not wine leaves, but juice leaves a little bit longer. So it gets more character. So you'll get, you'll get the, it's definitely, Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, but it's not, when you taste it, it's not this pure grassy green thing that you normally get. The label, so Fitzroy is the name of my uncle. When you're born in New Zealand, you're part of a tribe called an Iwi, and I'm part of the Ngāti Whātua because I'm from the far north. I normally have my um, emblem on, but I was swimming, so I took it off. The, uh, this flax is the native, the native um, uh, what the Maori used to wear, uh, was what they made their clothing out of. And so we put that on because I'm from the far north, it's a much thinner flax because we're from the subtropics. And uh, the stones are obviously from the vineyard, but I love this wine. It's killer. And uh, Christ, you're giving it away, mate. 18 bucks, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to make 11, it should be 20, at least. Anyway. Hats off to you, mate. We're changing it now that it went up. We're changing it. Scott, Scott, make some money, man. Stop giving it away. <laughs> we will. It's changing very soon. All right. One one thing to note about this is, you know, we're we're only a company of what six, seven, eight people. We're not the big corporate guys. So Kim Crawford at total is one point two million cases, right? And this is actually what twenty five hundred, twenty eight hundred, something like that. This is single vineyard Sauvignon. It's nice and concentrated and pretty. 
And then you're supporting the little guys like us and like Scott. And so we appreciate you buying this. Thank you. You will never find my wine at Total. Thank you. Thank you. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> um, or Costco, or, Costco to... or Sam's or Walmart or Bevmark. None of these big fellas. How about, how about the Zinfandel? Should we move on? What do you think, Scott? How's it going? I just wanted to say I particularly love the 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 aroma that you get from this wine. It just it's so fresh and uh, not I it just fruity, grapefruity. It just it's so inviting. It just it's it's impeccable for summer. It's just a wonderful summer wine. Scott, you're absolutely right. And the Greendale ladies are missing out because the thing about Sauvignon Blanc, with this Sauvignon Blanc, when you open it in your room, you know, and you're, and you're sitting down for dinner or whatever, the, the whole room stinks. <laughs> and when you're, when you're sitting outside, like the Greendale ladies are, you're not going to get the full waft. Uh, you're going you're gonna to smell the cut grass because that's where you are, but, you know. <laughs> anyway. Okay, red so time. Red, so we're moving, red, we're moving red, on to Zinfandel. Okay, yeah. I'll go. Um, so, so this is in the seven packs, right? Yeah. So this is the wine. The um, it was quite funny that I mentioned uh, Walmart and Sam's Club there because we made this wine for Walmart. It was originally called a, the Red Blend. So we make two under the Zinfandel label. A buddy of mine was going bankrupt, and he. Uh, he called me up and said, Nick, can you help me? And this was in 19, I don't know, 2001, but he'd sold the winery and he'd sold a contract for the grapes for three years. And so I went up and I, the wine was all still in tank at the winery. So it was a 2000, 2001 and 2002 vintages were all separate. So I said, well, let's bottle them all separately. And I called up a mate of mine at Walmart. He was a wine buyer for Walmart Sam's Club. I said, this guy's got a problem. Can you help us out? He goes, yeah, no problem. So we called it Fidelity. We launched it on Valentine's Day. We put a heart on the label. Have you seen all that? So you see all that, right? Fidelity, heart on the label, Valentine's Day, it all makes sense. Anyway, so everything went really well for two years. And then he calls me up and goes, Nick, I can't sell the last 500 cases. I'm like, dude, I haven't come out of the closet yet. I still work for LVMH. And uh, so I called up my three distributors, one in Boston, one in, one in uh, Indiana, and one in, in New Jersey. And they agreed to take the wine, the 500 cases. The next day, you wouldn't believe it, 92 points Best Buy wine enthusiast, they, uh, Bob calls me back up from Walmart and says, can I get my wine back? Today, if you look at the label, there's a broken heart on the label. And that's a screw you to Sam's Club, Walmart, Total, and everyone else that's screwing up this business. And that's why we don't sell it to them. <laughs> Anyway, this just got 92 points in the Wine Spectator. It's, uh, I'll show you a little quick video of the vineyard. It's called Rail Yard, which I'll explain here in a second, I think. You just have to give me a second to, uh, to find the... Uh, um, just find where I am. And for those listening, there's 14% Petite Syrah in this as well. And that's in the very same vineyard, or adjacent. Correct. G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here, winemaker for Trig Point Zinfandel. I am squinting into the sun. Whoa, check that out. And I'm standing out here in Rail Yard Zinfandel land. Down the end there, we have two railway lines. And Rail Yard is also the name of a rugby stadium that was imploded in New Zealand a few years back. And it's quite fortuitous because right now we've got the, uh, the World Cup of Rugby going on. Anyway, let's check out some Zinfandel here. Uh, we come in here, this is probably one of the best sets I've ever seen for Zin. Big, even, not too much raisining, although the cluster next door has a bit of raisining. Hope you can see that, so we'll check out. I just put a couple of berries in my mouth. I just spat the pulp out. Now I'm chewing the skin. Lots of good tannin, lots of good flavor. And then spat again, you can see how purple it was, and that indicates to me that we're very close to harvest. In fact, we've got this down to pick in about five days. Anyway. So the, um, this vineyard is, if you know uh, Healdsburg where I live, so we're about 
10 minutes. So Healdsburg, which is an amazing town for those who haven't been. So we're one hour north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And Healdsburg has four appellations that all meet there. Dry Creek, Alexander Valley, Russian River, and Chalk Hill. And if you drive north on the freeway for about five minutes, you end up in a town called Geyserville. And this vineyard is right in Geyserville. This is the town. And this is the vineyard right here. There's a little hotel here called the Hoffman House. So you can't miss it. But uh, as Susan pointed out, this is uh, planted as Infidel and this is planted as Petit Sirah. So Fidelity today, because of the original story that I mentioned, the, um, that it was a blend, the red, red was a blend, the red, red Bordeaux blend. If you get a chance to try that, it's an amazing wine. But the Fidelity Zin is also a blend. So yeah, we'll, we'll use between, I don't know, 5 to 13, 15% in any year of the Zin Pindel. I think we just put together, we're just putting together the 2019 right now. And I'm looking at putting about a little bit more petite in in the 19. So probably be closer to 15 in the 19, for instance. But anyway, that's, uh, that's where the vineyard is. And um, my key, my, my point is I really, it's the same, like I talked about earlier. I think uh, you can, you know, Drinking, drinking two glasses of Zinfandel for me is always an effort. So trying to be able to have, go back and have that second glass. Cause what happens is with the, I showed it quickly in that video there, there's raisin, there's some raisins in there, but not a lot. But when you have Zinfandel always has more raisins. And when you crush the grapes into the tank, we always test the sugar. We want to see what the sugar is. Cause that tells us how much alcohol we're going to get. When you go back with Zinfandel, it's because we have so many raisins, those raisins swell up and you go back to the same tank the next day and the sugar's gone up. And so it's very hard to predict where the alcohol is going to end up. And that's why you end up with a lot of Zinfandels at 16, 17 alcohol, which is not very good. And the other thing is we have two forms of sugar, we have glucose and fructose. And the fructose is very hard to ferment. So as the glucose decrease, how do I do this? As the glucose decrease, um, the alcohol goes up. And as the alcohol gets to about 15, the yeast start to die. And so it's hard for men to ferment the fructose. So when you end up with um, 16, 17 alcohol, you may end up with four or five grams of sugar. But the problem is that sugar is very, very sweet because fructose is a much sweeter sugar than glucose. When you and that's why, you know, it's the whole thing about Coca-Cola syndrome. So people get used to drinking uh, Coke, which has a lot of fructose, uh, sugar in it. So, anyway, we try to we try to avoid that. Anything else, Susan? Uh, no, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, so it's been a really successful wine. Uh, we don't we don't normally submit our wines to magazines, but for some reason, the Wine Spectator managed to pick up on that one, and they got a ninety two, which is um, unusual. So the next wine before we go into the daughters. I ask you how many cases you make of Fidelity because we've had tons of it from Scott. He carries a lot of it. How many cases do you make a year? Of the Zinfandel, we made, I think of the 2018, we made about 1,200, something like that. And we're just bottling the 2019 this t next week, this week? Yeah, we won't release it though until mm -hmm. OND. Yeah, okay. A vineyard up there named, that you, named Gemrose. Sorry, what was the question? What was the question? You know a vineyard up there, Gemrose? No, no. Is it in Alexander Valley? In Russia, I think it's Russian in River. Russian River, yeah. Ah, that's to the south. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, in the Russian River, typically Russian River is uh, there's two sorts to the Russian River. There's the Shard Pinot land, uh, which is nor which is more out towards the west. And then there's the southern part of the Russian River, which is where we are in the Sebastopol Hills, which is grown to Chardonnay. And that's where the gold-rich soils are. That's where that special soil is. And then there's sort of a third little area, which is where you may be talking about. And that's um, it's the older area closer to Healdsburg, which was originally dry farm. That's where the, all the Italians were. And so in that area, there's still some Zinfandel planted. So that, that may be what you're talking about. So... That area close to Healdsburg that's called Russian River should really be part of Dry Creek, but you know, I'm not going to argue semantics. All right. Um, I'm, if, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to listen to Susan this time. I'm, I'm going to put the three daughters together. So we're going to talk about chakras, which is 
the Argentinian Malbec, which is this wine here. This is, um, so uh, I'll just quickly show you where we are and then I'll jump off. So this is my son, Luke, he's a winemaker as well. He was, he was uh, working in Catena uh, for the vintage. So he was actually, we were both caught down there during the pandemic. So I was in Chile, he was in Argentina. I got the third flight out. Um, Susan, you'll have to keep an eye on the time because I don't have any watch with me. Um, the, I, I was, I got the third, there was three flights out of South America. <laughs> I got one of them and, uh, but Luke didn't. So he got caught. So he ended up uh, staying in Mendoza for another month. He didn't get out of Mendoza until April, but there was very little, um, COVID in Mendoza, uh, cause Argentina would never be able to support an outbreak of, uh, a disease like this. Although Chile is well swamped. I don't know if you guys are watching right now, but Chile could become the next Brazil. Um, anyway, so uh, he was down there. We're very fortunate. You can see how old the vineyard is. And this is, um, I'm sitting at, just to put it in perspective, I'm sitting at 6,000 feet here right now. Lake Tahoe is at 6,000 feet. Uh, Donna Summit is at 6,700 feet. And this vineyard is at 6,000 feet as well. So it's extremely cold. So these vines you're looking at are 80 years old. But if I was to walk up to them and guess, I would say they're like 30 to 40 years old because the growth is so slow at these altitudes. Uh, where we are, for those who have never been, this is the Andes Mountain. This is Chile on this side. And this is Mendoza. And we're talking about this. This is uh, the Mendoza province. This is San Juan, uh, which is the other big area. But there are four Appalachians in Mendoza. This is San Rafael. We don't really care about San Rafael. This is the Central Valley, which is the most expensive area. The Central Valley, I know in California, it means not very interesting wines, but in Argentina, it's Vistalba, Luján, Lunte, Grallo, which is the traditional old vine Malbec area. And then we have the Eastern region, which is where a lot of the wineries are, and they grow a, a variety called Bonada. And Bonada is blended with a lot of Malbec. And then uh, where we are, we're in the Uco Valley. And uh, this is also an old area. It's very hard to get to. When I first started going to Mendoza, it would take us about four hours to get up into the Uco Valley. Today, we can get up there in about an hour and a half because uh, the roads are in so much better condition. Uh, the region is broken up and uh, what's wrong, Susan? Oh, well, I'm just, you want to tell them eventually about the city of Chakras, but. Yeah, got, okay. so where we are is uh, the traditional areas are, are um, this middle area here, which is, um, Altamir and Vista Flores and Tunajan. So this is Tunajan, the Tunajan River, and this is the Mendoza River. And uh, to the north, they started planting in Tupangado in 1990 and to the south in La Consulta. So we're up here in the San Carlos uh, region, which is one of the oldest regions. But Chakras, the name of the wine is actually down here. Mm -hmm. And that's the town in Mendoza where all the winemakers live. And it reminds me of Healdsburg. So in Healdsburg, it goes restaurant, bar, tasting room, restaurant, bar, tasting room. In Chakras, it goes restaurant, bar, butcher shop, restaurant, bar, butcher shop. <laughs> and it's so funny. On a Saturday or a Sunday, you go to the butcher shop and you take a number and you go back at your requested time because all the meat is cut by hand and it's, um, it's a real big tradition, especially in the summer. There's a picture of the vineyard in the winter. You can, uh, it's unbelievable. So uh, further up in the vineyard, I've actually skied uh, down, the, down the hill. G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm the winemaker for Chakras, which is uh, Orca Valley Malbec that we make up here in Argentina. And I'm sitting here, this is the young vine. These vines are about 50 years old, uh, versus one of the other wines that we work on called Pedrusco, which is about 80 years old. So here we have a few more clusters. This is Franco, so it's grown on its own roots. So this is some of the oldest Malbec that you'll ever find in Argentina. And we're up here in Altamira, which is at a little bit about 1200 meters so it's relatively cool Appalachian so you're going to get a lot of fresh fruit a lot of vibrancy very very purple hue in the wine itself so Chakras is the name of the town where all the winemakers live in downtown Mendoza but we're up here in the Uco Valley which is about an hour away from Chakras itself beautiful wine 2020 vintage looking awesome hope you get a chance to enjoy it yeah so it's a pretty special place um and I and I, uh, I I almost live in Chile. I, I I'm there for three and a half to four months a year, 
and I'm in Argentina a lot as well. So I consult in Argentina as well as make a couple of my own projects down there. But it's, uh, I've been making wine in Argentina now since 19, well, I was the wine, first winemaker for a winery called Tarasis, which was owned by LVMH at the time in 1992. Uh, they, did, and they have a joint venture with a French company. Well, they're French as well. But uh, yeah, no, it's been a, it's a fun ride. And what's really cool about this wine is that if you gave me a glass of it blind and asked me where it's from, I would say it's, it's coastal. Because and when I think coastal, I think red cherries, vibrancy, purple, really purple color. Um, and, just, and, and remember, wine is a fruit. Wine is not wood. Wine is not malolactic. Wine is not tannin. It's fruit. So we've got to make the wine taste fruity. And then you find out, oh, it's not coastal. In fact, it's miles from the coast. If you were to drive from Mendoza to Buenos Aires, it's 20 hours. That's straight east. Now, if you, go to, if you want to go to the coast in Chile, you go up the mountains and down the other side. If you can get through customs, because customs normally takes, it can take anywhere between one hour and six hours. But if you can get through, if you did a straight drive from Mendoza to Santiago, you can actually get there in four hours. So we're a long way from the, from the ocean because you're at such high altitude, you get that same characteristic. And that's what makes uh, Ultimura and Vista Flores unique in terms of Malbec, but also unique in terms of different, differentiation to Vistalba, Luhan and the traditional areas of Mendoza. So beautiful, beautiful area. What do you think, Susan? One thing I wanted to add about this wine, a lot of um, the Malbecs have Bernarda and Cot mixed in. And so it's to reach a price point of $9.99 or $10.99. And then you get this sweet, jammy, fruity. This is earth. It's, it's like you get tobacco and smoke. And this is 100% Malbec. And that's what you're getting. You're not getting that sweet jamminess. For you foodies, this is just fabulous with like grilled sausages and peppers. A little sweetness, a little bit of aromatic spice, and this is just killer, especially with fall, venison, uh, duck, that kind of thing. So that's why it's a price a little bit more because 100% Malbec is actually more expensive yeah. than Bonarda and Cod. So it's, it's um, Bonarda, Bonarda is easy to understand because it's a different variety, but Cot is the French clone of Malbec. I know it's hard to explain, but it's a. Uh, it is a different variety, but it doesn't have a wing on it. So if you look at a, a normal cluster of Malbec, it has the wing on it and it has, uh, it's a much smaller cluster and it ripens later than cot. And cot, they planted cot because it ripens earlier, it accumulates sugar earlier, and, but it is more spicy. And when guys go to me, well, Nick, do you want uh, cot or you want Malbec? I'm like, well, I just want the Malbec. And uh, they go, no, no, it's the same. I'm like, it's not the same because Malbec costs $1,000 a, uh, sorry, $1,000 a ton more than cot. I'm like, so it's not the same. And so it's this whole different argument about uh, what's the difference between cot and, uh, and Malbec. So anyway. Does anyone have any questions or Scott, do you have comments or? No, okay, he's good, he's muted. Okay. Oh, I can unmute you, Scott. There you go. No, you got to unmute yourself now. I've unmuted you. Hi. Hi, Scott. <laughs> How's it going? Talk amongst yourselves while I open a bottle of wine. <laughs> so if I'm being honest, I love the Chakra Smallback. It's, it's too big of a wine for my palate. I well, then just have half a glass. It's, uh, no, it's, it's, um, it's a big wine for it being a Malbec. Because I have other Malbecs that have that, but this is like, it's got some intensity to it. Yeah, you got to go big or go home, sweetie. That's true. <laughs> uh, and Scott, what, you, what you're describing is perfect description for um, cot. So cot's more dilute. It's not as, it's not as big as Malbec. Yeah. But this also is why Scott is a great store owner, because he's carrying things that have a wide appeal might not be just what he likes yeah. it's got wide appeal so kudos yeah you're not just a pretty face scott <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> all right so we normally that chakras in california is 25 bucks 
So uh, 20 bucks is a pretty good deal. Oh, he's got it for 26 here. 26? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, well, you're right. You're right in there. That's right. Yeah. Cost us a cost us a buck to ship it to you. A couple. It's expensive to ship and tax to get it here. It's what eight or nine dollars, Caitlin, a case extra. I mean, it's yeah. But anyway, thanks for carrying it, Scott. It's special. Only six hundred cases made of this wine. Six hundred yeah, cases. So you're not going to find it at Total, my friend. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I got five. I got five kids, and um, in uh, I was telling you know when I was living in Chile in back in the '80s when Pinochet was still in power, one of the ways dictators keep uh, control of people is um, they'll turn off the food, they turn off the oil, they turn off the power. So making wine without electricity is very difficult. So I was telling my kids how to make wine without electricity. And they're like, yeah, right, Dad, whatever. So we started making wine without power. So in 1999, 2000, we, all the kids came out when we, we hand-picked half a ton of grapes. We handy-stemmed it, which is really difficult because it takes uh, two days to handy-stem half a ton. The uh, girls did the pijage. The boys did the punch down. We, we basket-pressed it. and We pumped it into a barrel. I wasn't stat stupid. I put the barrel in a warehouse because I wanted to keep it cool. But the uh, anyway, we made a wine called Five Gold Hands Unplugged. And uh, we still do that wine today. It's, um, it's a cool little thing that we do just with the kids. So anyway, Chelsea in 2002 um, wanted to uh, make wine with me. And we, have, we live on a little vineyard in Dry Creek. And so we made a, and it's a Merlot vineyard. So we started making a little wine called Chelsea Dry Creek Merlot. Well, it became pretty successful. And and uh, the vineyard only produces about uh, 800 cases. And so we started making wine from the Alexander Valley. So this vineyard is a vineyard I've known since uh, 1990. So all the vineyards I've been working on for more than 15 years, I thought it was really funny. You know, the wine enthusiast came out with a magazine that said the 40 best winemakers under 40 years old. Do you guys remember that? If you read the wine enthusiast, they are exactly the wines I'm not going to drink. Why would I drink a wine from a winemaker that's only 40 years old? He hasn't even made wine for five years let alone from the same vineyard. So when Kim Jong-un drops a nuclear bomb on California, we'll go to the bunker. The last thing I'm taking is a wine from a 40-year-old winemaker. I want one that's going to last. I'm going to be down there for a long time. Anyway, so uh, we started making wine together. So uh, this, is, this vineyard used to be Milestone from Clos de Bois. If you remember that, it used to sell for 65 bucks. So same winemaker, same vineyard, but it's not $65. Today, Scott's giving it away for what, 40 bucks? 20. 20, Christ! Anyway, so uh, <laughs> this, is a picture of my, this is a picture of my daughter. So when she was two, I traced her around her head and then she colored it in and that's where the label comes from. And uh, this vineyard is uh, pretty cool. I, I, I'm going to show you. A, I think I have a, oh, I have a harvest photo. I'll show you this one. Um, So those are the three daughters. These are the labels. You'll notice that Catherine faces a different direction because Catherine's the middle child. She's the liar, the manipulator, the bullshit artist, thinks outside the box. You middle children know what it's like. It's us persecuted firstborns that uh, are always in trouble. And uh, Hillary's our youngest daughter. So where we are in the Alexander Valley, the Alexander Valley looks like an upside down Y. This is the Russian River. This is Healdsburg down here uh, where my office is and that's where I live. One side of the Y goes down this way and the other side of the Y goes over this way into Knights Valley and then into uh, Napa Valley. Kate or the Catherine Vineyard Stone Mason is going to be here. Um, we're talking about the Chelsea, which is what we're tasting now, which comes from just south of Guyseville. And you tried the Fidelity earlier, uh, which is here. Uh, this is a picture of the five kids. If you can see it, I have to shut this down. Uh, this is Chelsea. Uh, she's 28 now. Uh, Hillary is, as I said, she just finished uh, high school and Kate is, she's a vet, veterinary technologist. Uh, so we're talking about Chelsea called Guidestone Rise. It's 100% Merlot. So the key thing for me is that it's, um, it's, a, it's a Cabernet drinker's Merlot. The, the key thing about Merlot is the size of the berry. These berries weigh about 1.2 grams. So they're much bigger than Cabernet. Cabernet weighs 0.95 grams. So if you take a 1.2 gram berry and dehydrate at 10%, you're shriveling the berry. So you're concentrating sugar acid and tannin, and that's not very interesting. 
So we want to have the soil have really good water holding capacity. So we look for a little bit more clay. I learned this with carmenere in Chile. So growing carmenere, it's the late, it's the late grape grape. And um, Merlot is pretty much the same sort of large berry, but we do pick a little bit earlier. So we want to have nice, even water coming through the vine through uh, till we pick it. So uh, that's the key thing about the, um, the Chelsea Merlot. G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm standing out here in the Chelsea Merlot vineyard, Alexander Valley. And we are about, I don't know, 70, 80% through Veraison. If you can see down here, if I move a few clusters, uh, leaves, I mean, you can see that uh, we're coloring up quite nicely. A little way to go. This is the uh, second week of um, September that we're looking about in terms of harvest. And that would be about right on average. So uh, looking good. We love the soil here. A lot of good water holding capacity. We've got a long way to go in terms of holding this canopy on. But we're in really good shape and really excited about the 2019 Chelsea Goldschmidt Alexander Valley Merlot out here in the Alexander Valley. Beautiful. Love it. Hi, I'm Chelsea Goldschmidt and after my workouts I always crave a nice glass of Merlot. So I'm obviously drinking my favorite Merlot, the Chelsea Goldschmidt. This one is 2017 from Alexander Valley. Reminds me of back home in Sonoma County while I'm here in isolation in the Bay Area. So let's see how it is. It's the perfect wine for isolation, drink by yourself, or if you need a glass after spending the day with your family, it's always there. So let's see how it is. Smells like black cherry and pomegranate and chocolate. Yum. And it tastes like um, strawberries and plum. It's delicious. I hope you really enjoy it and I hope it keeps you company in your quarantine. Stay safe, everyone. Cheers. So uh, yeah, she's a she's a unique character. So she's um, she's in the middle of doing her masters in uh, marine biology, but she's also a lecturer. But it was pretty funny because they live in San Leandro. You know these you know how these kids are living these days. You know one bedroom apartments and there's nowhere to get out. So they work out at home. You know, but they these kids are serious, man. They work out for like hours at a time. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And they're all working out together. It doesn't matter what country they're all in. They're all, uh, they're all uh, working out in place. And then, uh, yeah, so it was quite cool that she sent me that little video that of her uh, after a workout session. But I love what I get. I, this wine is just super, super intense. It just And in California, the big wines are duck corn and decoy, but this is actually number three. Uh, we do sell it into a, into a larger chain here in, in, the nor in Northern California. And this is the number three selling Merlot behind, behind duck corn and decoy. The other big brands that you'll probably know would be St. Francis or Alexander Valley Vineyards and Rodney Strong. They'd be the other three. But uh, this wine is outselling them, which is really cool. So uh, we've had a lot of success with this. And uh, this is the 2018. Now, 18 was an earlier vintage. So let's face it. The last bad vintage we had in California was 93. I don't know. I mean, 13, four, I mean, 2000, and, I, I'm, I, I will admit, 2012, if you guys see a 2012 from a reputable company, I mean, 2012 is an amazing vintage. Okay, so we really like the Chelsea. Can we carry it in Scott's shop? Can you carry it where? In Scott's shop. This is Susan? New. This is new, and uh, I'm sure between Caitlin's talent and Scott's good taste, boom. Well, we can order it directly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, Scott. I have, uh, currently I have nine bottles sitting there. No, no, I'm talking about the Chelsea. That's right. I'm uh, talking about Caitlin. I have a lot in the warehouse I can send. Yeah, and we've got some in California. So. Awesome. I approach my, my thought. Oh, so a little thing about me. So for anybody who doesn't know, prior to selling wine, Anything that was red, I was usually putting white soda in it. <laughs> Taking the spritzer. I would spritz it up and make it into a lamb like a lambrusco. 
So I've learned a great deal through through all through all my wine uh, rep representatives of Legacy Brand. I've learned, but for me, I enjoy this Merlot as long as I do not aerate it in my mouth. Like as long as I'm not putting too much air into my mouth, and I keep my palate and my tongue close together. I get that super juicy, brambly, dark berried Merlot, and it's wonderful. It's it's wonderful. For me, when I put too much air into it and I get the pepperiness, I get, I, I, I like, oh, 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 oh. So this is like a super delicious Merlot, as long as I'm not putting too much air into my mouth, for me. But I, I love it. I love super, oh, I love the, the fruit that's coming out of it. I like what you said about the pepperiness because, um, by the way, just so you know, Merlot is the number one red grape in the world, right? I mean, a lot of people think that, Cabernet is. No, Merlot the, by far. The volume produced, yes. The volume no, I produced. Like, I like the Merlot because it's not that peppery. It's huge. Bingo. <laughs> yeah, because, Scott, you're wrong, you're wrong, mate. So here's my conversation. So the most peppery, spicy, sorry, Caitlin, girls, you want me to unmute you? I can unmute you, but, um, oh, there we go. I don't know what I just did. So the most peppery, spicy thing in the that you can drink is Carmenere, right? For those who've never had a Carmenere, you should really try one. And I'm sure Scott's got some in his store, but Carmenere from Chile, really fleshy and black fruit and full on, but extremely spicy. The second most spicy grape is Sauvignon Blanc. The third is Cabernet. And what happened was, Robert Parker, Jim Lowby from the Wine Spectator and all these, they, they don't like spice. So this is why they pushed all the Napa guys into making wines with high alcohol. Because when you make a high alcohol Cabernet, you don't get the varietal character. So if you give me 15 alcohol Cabernet from Alexander Valley, from Napa Valley, from Maipo, from Colchava, from Cachapo, from McLaren Vale, from Bordeaux, and I line them all up for you, you couldn't tell me where they're from. Because they all taste the same. You need the spice to make Cabernet distinctive. And if you don't like spice, drink goddamn Merlot. <laughs> so that's the thing. Merlot's not spicy. Anyway, Chelsea, 2018. I just blended the 19. Uh, I just went through all the 19s yesterday. Man, I think this is the one variety, the one grape. I mean, everyone, you know, we're known for Cabernet, right? So we, you know, Cabernet is our big thing, but. I'll tell you, if you line up 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 Merlot, every year is just like this. It's getting better, fuller, richer, more powerful. Man, I just, and then I'm, I'm like, I'm so excited. We just released the 18. I'm so excited already about the 19. It's like when I release the 17, I'm like, dude, the 18 is amazing. But anyway, I'm thinking that about the 19. It's just the 18 right now. If you buy it, just because um, we would have only just shipped the 18 out there, probably, Susan. We probably only just, the purchase orders for 18 would have only just got shipped. So um, buy it and drink it in a, drink it another 10 days or so because it just needs a little bit more time to catch up with uh, with the travel. No, we're actually a bit ahead of that. Here. Oh, you are? Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, drink, buy from Scott and drink now Florida. then. Florida or somewhere where they're not selling as much wine. Okay. All right, on to Catherine. So Catherine's our big deal. Well, for me, it's the big deal. It's our most popular wine. Uh, she's, a, she's a very interesting. I, I, you know, I, I don't think there's much, you guys will disagree with me on this. This is probably a very controversial thing to say, but I don't believe in star signs, but I do believe in birth order. And I went to a class once on um, one, one day, and how many fathers are in the room? All right, you, da you dads know what I'm talking about, right? Because one day you get a phone call from your wife and all you hear is this. You, you Greendale ladies, you appreciate this. What happens is I get a call from my wife on here. Uh, honey, I'm too drunk. I can't go to the parent-teacher night at school. Okay, this is every father's dream is to go to the parent-teacher night at school because you can only screw up. Because if you complain about your... You, you, you know, if they, if they complain to you about their daughter, you argue with the teacher or you argue with the headmaster and then next thing you know, your wife's getting a call and you're getting called up. It's not, it's not a good thing. So what happened 
happened was it was a life-changing experience for me. They broke the room up on first, second, third, twins, and lastborns. So I'm sitting at the big boy table because I'm a firstborn. I had to learn how to do this. This is not a firstborn trait because firstborns are usually uh, quiet, humble. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm acting more like a middle child right now. So um, I had to learn how to do this. I did stand-up comedy and told sheep jokes for a while. That's why I learned how to do it. So at each person's spot, there was a piece of paper and you had to line up. Uh, so what do firstborns do? We don't say hello. We don't make eye contact. We go straight to the task because we're, we're firstborns, are task oriented. We go straight down the list. And at the bottom, it said elect a spokesperson for the group. And I know what your firstborns are thinking. This is what every firstborn thinks. If no one volunteers, I'll volunteer. I waited 20 seconds. I put my hand up along exactly the same time as the other 13 firstborns. The secondborns are like, dude, can we get a firstborn over here? The thirdborns are like, what was the question? Because the thirdborns are still talking about themselves. And the lastborns are like, we ordered a cheeseburger. We don't even know why we're here. And I see it with my children. And that's why the labels face the other directions. Okay. So... Anyone want to refute birth order as being more important than star signs? No. And I know what middle children are thinking right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're the lovers. We're the peacemakers. We're the, uh, we are. We're the negotiators. We are. The ones that are neglected and they always feel left out. They're not <laughs> feeling the, the middle, The middle people, like myself, we the, are the troublemakers, but we are also, we have to, you know, work with these guys and the little sister. And we, we learn to negotiate. We kind of like played it all, all the different, yeah. So. Middle children love to say that about themselves, but they're not. They're manipulators. <laughs> Middle children are manipulators. We manipulators. are clean in that. Okay, so talk about these later. All right, before I do some noise. Okay, who's making noise? Okay, so um, these are all the cabernets we make. We make a lot. So we're going to be just talking about uh, Catherine tonight and Hillary in Oakville. Uh, the Catherine Vineyard comes from the uh, east side of the Alexander Valley. It's a little valley here. It's made up of five growers today. Yeoman, which is our top wine, sits above it. And uh, this is the Catherine Vineyard right below. The fire came through actually, and this barn doesn't exist anymore. It got burnt. The, um, the key things for me, it's on the middle of the slope. So it's the Piedmont area, which so it's, it's not on the valley floor and it's not on top of the hillside. I don't like top of hillsides because the soils are too thin and I get too much dehydration. And I don't like being on the valley floor because I get too much vigor. I like east facing slopes on all varieties. I didn't mention this earlier because I get morning sun. It's true in the Southern hemisphere too. And yes, the water does go down the toilet the other way. Um, so the sun does come up on the east in the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere. Because it's a mass selection, like we talked about earlier, it has lower yield. Uh, I don't want to talk about cane pruning. It is wild native yeast. We don't add any, any additions and all of our wines are vegan. We don't use any animal products that cannot be said for a lot of, uh, a lot of wines out here. Yes, Susan. Uh, also, all the Alexander Valley uh, wines that we have, along with the Russian River Chardonnay, is um, from Sonoma County, which is almost 100% sustainable, uh, along with Chile and uh, New Zealand. So that's kind of nice. We don't add a lot of chemicals or anything. I, they're getting completely away from that. And that's really valuable because I can drink copious amounts and I don't wake up with a hanger, hangover because we don't add a lot of stuff to these wines. So sustainable is really important along with the vegan. Right. We need to come up, we have a symbol for sustainability and I'm hoping in Sonoma County, I'm hoping that we can put it on the label because on New Zealand, you'll notice, you see this symbol here, that's the symbol for sustainability in New Zealand. Chile is uh, in process and Sonoma County is in process. We think by 2021, end of 2021, 98% of all the vineyards in Sonoma County be registered sustainable. And we're also concentrating on moving two of our vineyards to organic. I'm not an organic fan a believer in organic but i think the big thing for me is herbicides i mean that's another whole conversation but herbicides are the huge i mean herbicides should be banned but that's my opinion 
Mm -hmm. Right. Here's a here's a little drone video of the uh, of the vineyard. So you'll notice that this is a big bank of Cabernet that we've got here on the Piedmont slope. This you can see is very dark green. And so what we have here is a bigger canopy than we have crop load. So it tends to be undercropped. We don't have enough fruit here. Uh, so I have to pick this separately. And as the drone comes around here, you'll notice this area here, uh, the canopy and the crop are about in the right balance. And it's nice and even. We had a bit of a slip here. That's why there's a difference here. And then here we are overcropped. So this piece of the vineyard is got too small a canopy and too much crop. So we actually drop a lot of the crop here. And uh, we zoom in here because this is our last day of the uh, car that we have here, the Suburban, that Hillary the next day rode off. So it pleased by Hillary to help support um, Kate, uh, Hillary's uh, ability to pay off her insurance. So uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, beautiful little car. So what we do is, um, I just, I just want to speak about this, if I can do this offline. I, I, as Susan knows, I normally draw this, but I'm not going to do it today. So these three wines, the one that was dark, that had the dark canopy and was, in my mind, undercropped, this is what we call the dense wine. So normally in, Calo in Bordeaux, from flowering to harvest, it's 100 days, okay? Right now we're at set, so we're about... Uh, 20 days in after flowering right now. So we've got about 80 days left before we harvest. However, this is not true in California. In California, we can pick between 125 and 145 days. Napa Valley is warmer. So normally we pick at about 125 days in Napa Valley. And in Alexander Valley, we normally pick at about 140 days because Alexander Valley is cooler. We're cooled from the ocean, whereas Napa Valley is cooled from San Francisco Bay. The vines with the big canopy, I pick earlier, normally about 100, 125, 130 days because there's so much power in that grapevine and so little crop that the, the vine is pulling moisture from the soil. And when it runs out of the soil, it starts immediately pulling from the, from the grape. And so I go out to the vineyard, I, I taste it, it goes, the tannins go green, dusty, dry, 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 raisin. Because as soon as the moisture runs out in the soil, the grape starts, the, the canopy starts pulling from the cluster. And so we don't want that to happen. So I pick it a little bit earlier. And this is what makes the dense wine. So there's three forms of wine. The elegant wine, which is soft berry fruit wine right up on front of the tongue. The powerful wines, which provide the flesh and the weight in the middle of the tongue. And the dense wines, which provide the structure and the finish. And so that wine is what we call the dense wine. The powerful wine is what you saw in the middle. And the elegant wine, we remove crop. It's always going to be much more fruity than it is tannic in the elegant wines. And so we pick them last at 145 days. So here's a little video of it. Uh, as soon as I, uh, where did I get? Hey. No, damn it. <laughs> Let's give it a roll. G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm sitting here with three glasses of wine and everything we do is single vineyard. And the way we get complexity out of a single vineyard is by choosing blocks and styles or working the wines to the way the vines best exemplify themselves. So when I was young, I walked into a room once a pretty well-known winery with 200 wines on the table. I'm wondering how am I going to blend 200 wines? I came from New Zealand, I didn't know anything about Cabernet. And so working with a consultant, we figured out the best way to do this is to put them into families. Elegant wines, which are the soft berry fruit wines right up on front of the tongue, the powerful wines which provide the fleshiness and the richness, and the dense wines which give us structure and power. So when we go ahead and line all those wines up, I sorted all the elegant wines together and I made a, I chose the best elegant wines and made a blend. I got the best powerful wines and made a blend, the best dense wines and made a blend. And we had three wines, all from the same vineyard, all from maybe in the same block or not the same block, but all from the same vineyard. And then we made a blend of these three wines and it was the most complex wine that we could possibly make. So today I continue that process with elegant wines, 
We can extract them a little bit more aggressively because we know that the tannins are in a lower concentration than the fruit, so we can extract more tannin. Whereas on a dense wine, if we made wine like that, they become too dry and too tannic. So we lower the extraction and try and make the wines more fruit forward. So if I was to drink an elegant wine, I'm going to get more red cherry, great structure, very forward in the mouth, very, very elegant, very ripe, but good acidity, red fruit, and very forward in the mouth. The powerful wine, I can immediately get it. It's more black cherry, a little bit of walnut, and the mouth is really rich, really full, powerful. Not a lot going on in the front of the mouth, not a lot going on in the structural part of the mouth either. And then the dense wines, much more chocolate, a lot more black cherry, but all finished, very supple tannins, good structure, good acidity. And so when we put the three together, hopefully, and it's never 30, 30, 30, because in a warm vintage, I probably want a little bit more of the dense component, whereas in a cool vintage, I want more of the elegant component. So it really depends on the vintage. And when I put all three together, we get the most complex wine we possibly can from the same vineyard. And that's how we make single vineyard wines really complex. So what do you guys think? You like the Catherine? Is it all right? And normally this, this would sell for 25 bucks and Scott's selling it for... $20.50. Yeah, 20 bucks and 50 cents. Well, there you go. You can't be right every day. Her. Come on, guys, any questions? Or are you just getting happier? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Weinbergers, you guys are trouble. I, I want to party with you guys. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're with me. <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, her mom. Wait, wait. <laughs> what, what do you mean they're with you? So I'm her mom. mom. Oh, my God, you're right there. That is too good. Yay, oh. All right, well, when Carolyn's out, when she's out one night, maybe we can party without her. Yeah. <laughs> They're coming back to Wisconsin. Look out. He's coming back, guys. So, what do you think about this one? We, we're going to taste this one. You want to talk about Oakville a little bit? How yeah, you so doing time-wise? You all right? What is the time, Susan? Uh, 710. Oh, shoot. We're going over. Right, I'll just show one. I'm, I'll just show one video where the uh, where the uh, vineyard is, and you'll appreciate. Um, I think you'll appreciate uh, that as being the main part of the story. So this wine just got nine. Uh, that's Catherine just got ninety two points. As I said, it normally sells for uh, for uh, twenty five bucks. But Hittery, uh, Hittery comes from this here. This is Highway Twenty Nine. This is Saint Helena up here. If you head south. Uh, you guys know this winery here, that's um, Mondavi. This is Faniente. That's Nickel and Nickel. That's Opus, and this is Hillary. So same driveway as uh, Nickel and Nickel and Opus. That's Napa Wine Company. This is Oakville Crossroad right there, if that makes sense. I always, I put this up because I think it's hilarious because um, Hillary always outscores Catherine because they always say that Oakville outscores Alexander Valley. And yet, I don't know, 92, 93 points, but it's, you know, obviously a big difference in price. I mean, you're talking about double the price uh, to get an Oakville cab because of, uh, of the location and you're paying for his pedigree. But just to show you what the pedigree is, because to try and find an Oakville Cabernet for $55 is pretty unheard of, as Susan will tell you. The the next cheapest, I hate to say that word, cheapest, the next cheapest Alexander Valley, um, Oakville Cabernet is Mondavi Reserve, or Mondavi Oakville at 75 bucks. And then we have one called Game Ranch at 85 bucks. So Hillary is by far the best value Oakville cab in the market. And uh, to even to get 93 points for, a, for the best value is um, pretty significant. Right there is the beautiful Nickel Nickel Winery and their vineyard and that's Hillary down there at that end and there's Opus, beautiful Opus out here in the Oakville getting ready to pick Hillary tomorrow. Cabernet Sauvignon, Oakville, Napa Valley. 
So again, when when you run to the bunker and you have to decide which wine you're going to take, uh, you can take a, a one, bo one bottle of one of those more famous wines, whether it's Screaming Eagle, what else is in Oakville? Screaming Eagle, <laughs> Scarecrow, Harlan, Minor, Groth, Plump Jack, Silver Oak. They're all in they're all in Oakville. Or you can take a couple of six packs of Hillary. So there you go. Here's a and here's a little look at the vineyard. Here in the beautiful old vineyard in Oakville. This is the charming creek vineyard that we use for Hillary. Just a beautiful old vineyard. You can see we use permanent cover. We don't do any weed spraying. You can still see that the weeds are underneath all the vines. We do this because we have good water holding capacity, nice water penetration when it does rain, and also a buildup of organic matter. Just a beautiful old vineyard out here in the heart of Oakville, planted to the old trellis system that they used to use. Yeah, so it's an old, old vineyard, unfortunately, it's gradually dying because of disease, because of the age. Uh, they were pretty harshly planted back in the 70s, these guys. And uh, so, but the location's amazing. Uh, certainly the best value. We pick it three ways. We have three different rootstocks, just like we talked about with the Catherine Vineyard. And um, anyway, just in conclusion, so everything we do is one vintage, one variety, and they're all vegan, except for the Fidelity wine that you tasted. Our neighbors, are, uh, are all really well known in the Russian River, Kokomo, William Salem, Costa Brown, Alexander Valley, Jordan, Silver Oak, Robert, Robert Young, and we could add uh, Alexander Valley vineyards to that. In Oakville, we're talking about Nickel, Nickel, Opus, Mondavi, Ingle Nook. And if I put up uh, the Boulder Bank that you had earlier, that we're talking about Cloudy Bay, Alan Scott, uh, Paratines, and Stonely. All of these vineyards have been working on for many years, and uh, this is a way to get hold of us. We uh, YouTube is probably the easiest way if you want to see anything that we're doing. We've got over 480 videos are up there now posted from various different vineyards and uh, different sequences. And there's a whole series on education as well. So some of the charts that I would normally have drawn are, are up there. Uh, and then Instagram, obviously, we post, we post a lot on Instagram as well. Uh, and we do have a tasting room now. It's, it's out on Dry Creek Road. So we started there last weekend, and this weekend will be our second second weekend. But it's been extremely popular already as California gradually opens up. We're pretty happy about that. It's called the Poor House, and uh, for obvious reasons. And uh, this is a way to get a hold of me if you want to email me. That's my email address, and uh, love to see you come out in uh, in uh, wine country. So yeah, Scott, thank you for. Uh, putting all this on and Susan for your tenacity to make it happen. We appreciate that as well. And okay. all you guys for showing up. Thank appreciate you. Kevin. And, but most of all, thank you to the consumers who bought the wine without you. We have nothing. And yes. you're, the most, you. you're dear to us. You're dear to us. Nice. Cheers to everybody. Thing. I'm empty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the bottle's fine, Scott. The bottle's fine. <laughs> Gosh. Any questions, you guys, for Nick? Questions for Nick? Come on, stump the winemaker. So, yeah, I'm, I'm loving the Hillary. It's, okay. Why does it taste okay, more balanced to me than the Catherine? It's, it seems just so yeah. perfectly balanced. Yeah. yeah, so that's a really valid and good question. So yeah, no, he'll say that's really stupid. people ask me all the time, I'm figuring out where the sun's not going to hit me. I'm sorry, guys. You, guys you don't like your daughter better. Hillary better than Catherine, do you? <laughs> People ask, so we, the, the, to, um, to answer your question, it's like, when should I drink, uh, another way to ask, ask question is, when should I drink my Alexander Valley Cabernet and when should I drink my Napa Valley Cabernet? So what you've just experienced, if you've just drunk, I don't know how many different wines you've drunk tonight, four or five different wines? Seven. <laughs> Eleven wines, okay. So you, your palate is getting more and more tired. And so it's not as fresh as when you first started. And I mean, I'm, obviously I do my, you know, I, I taste two, 200 wines a day when I'm, when I'm consulting or whatever. But wow. and so I, I do certain things to my palate to keep it fresh all the time. But for you, you didn't spit, you drank all the wines and now you've come to the last wine and you're looking for something that's, that's fuller and richer and more balanced. And that's what you're getting. So what I do is, home, I will drink the Alexander Valleys with food. 
and then I drink the Napa Valley wines with the cheese. Because Alexander Valley's got more acidity to it. It's brighter, it's fresher, it's got more red fruit. Yeah. Whereas Napa Valley's got darker fruits, more blackberry, black cherry, and it's fuller in the mouth. And so it's more mouth coating, more, it wraps your tongue. Napa Valley wraps your tongue, whereas Alexander Valley is more of a seamless wine. It's not as, it's a little bit more uh, structural, if you like. So yeah, at this point in the evening, I would be enjoying the Napa Valley a little bit more than the Alexander Valley as well. And that's probably, what, people often say to me, hey dude, you know, I just, I just had my second bottle of Catherine. It just didn't taste like the first one. The first one was great. I'm like, oh, what happened? When, when did you drink the first one? Well, it was Friday night. I came home from work. I asked my girlfriend to marry me. It was the best night. When did you have the second one? <laughs> oh, it was Monday night. I just came home from work. I had a fight with my, with my wife and it just didn't taste as good. Yes, this is the point. It's all about <laughs> reference. And so if you've been drinking, if you've drunk four or five wines already, the nap is going to taste different to what it would have. If we'd started with the Hillary, if we'd started with the Hillary, you'd probably be thinking the other way around. But yeah, I agree with you. Right here, right now, after drinking five wines, Hillary's the best. And, and guys, uh, just to point out, this is not something that Scott normally carries. Is that right, Scott? That is correct. This oh, is a special on, thing that he brought in. I took, I took a lot of pride in the fact that I carried wines that were between 12 and $25. So this is like above that, that realm, but I'm, you know, the, I'm in my fourth year of uh, selling wine and I'm, you know, I've already put in some other wines that are more than $25 a bottle. And this is spectacular. And I'm not a cab drinker. Anybody who knows me knows I don't, do full bodied, but this is delicious. Okay, so Scott, we are full bodied. We are good customers. We love it. <laughs> <laughs> Pay fifty dollars for a bottle. We love it. <laughs> That's fantastic. And you can always get it. it. You may not carry it on the shelf, per uh, se, but have, you can always get it. I mean, mm -hmm. right? Caitlin, yeah. you on there? Yep. Absolutely. Without opening up another can of worms. You also make some wonderful uh, uh, wines under the label of Forefathers. Is Am I correct in saying that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Forefathers, and, we make a... Uh, Yemen we still, and the Game Ranch. Uh, there's no, some, no, well, no, Forefathers, we, in the U.S. we only have two wines, a Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc and a Cabernet from the Alexander Valley. But really special wine that is... It's normally about 55, 60 bucks for the, um, for the four brothers Lone Tree Cab. The Goldschmidt Game Ranch and Yeoman, they're like the next step up. So they're, uh, they're Alexander Valley is normally, it's called Yeoman. It's around about 75 bucks. And the Game Ranch, which is right next to Screaming Eagle is 85 bucks. So when you think about the same fence line as Screaming Eagle, um, Tench, which is a very famous vineyard in Oakville that you probably haven't heard of. Um, Gargiulio and Silver Oak. Uh, those are the those. Are, that's the fence line for this wine that sells for eighty five bucks, which is called Game Ranch. It's an amazing, amazing value. We only make about three hundred cases of that. Good question. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I just wanted to say thank you. We really enjoyed this and got educated on our wines. We've been uh, consumers without education, so thank you. Well, I hope I didn't put you off. <laughs> oh, no, no. We just, just the opposite. We learned to, to appreciate your wines, and um, Catherine's my favorite. Thank you. And if I figure this, if I figure out the way I recorded the show, I'll send it to Scott, and he can send it to you so you can watch it again if you want. Love to. Any other questions? I do. I have a question. I mean, you can hear. You're good. All right. <laughs> I have a question. What is, why do... I get a headache sometimes when I drink wine and like typically if I finish one glass of wine, I will have a headache and I don't have a headache and I've tasted all of these wines with Caitlin. What is the difference? What's I use very, I use very little preservative. Okay. So the SO, SO2 is the preservative. <laughs> and, um, 
SO2 is the preservative in wine. So, and the, and the way you know about SO2 is with dried fruits. If you eat raisins or apricots, uh, dried apricots, they've got massive amounts of SO2. And so what, we, what I do is during the winemaking process, I allow the wine to absorb oxygen throughout its life. So if you look at my Chardonnay, the 2019 Chardonnay right now, it's brown because it's got no SO2 in it. And about a month before bottling, we'll add the SO2, the wine will become clear. And there's two forms of SO2. There's the free and the bound. And when you smell, you'll smell the free. And when you taste, you'll taste the bound, which gives you bitterness. But yeah, a lot of these Chardonnays, or even Cabernets, are up over 100 parts bound. Not that it means anything to you, but 100, 140 parts. We're normally about 70, which is about as low as you can get without making the wine oxidized. So yeah, we use very little amounts of preservative. And I think that that's the key. The second thing is, if you want to prevent yourself, from uh, having that problem, what you can do is you can take an aspirin 20 minutes before you drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what, it, what it does is it, it thins out your blood mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll have less effect. But the, hmm. the problem is you have to figure out, I'm gonna drink in 20 minutes. That's a big problem. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> We're, we're all in timing with our drinking, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a little, a little V8, low salt V8 has potassium. That's okay. secret. Yeah, I have that stocked in the fridge. Drink it at night. At night. And if you if you eat a banana, it has a lot of potassium, but you have crazy dreams. Cool. <laughs> Love it. Love it. But this, this is the crazy. This is the crazy thing about organics. People think orange juice is good for you. Orange juice is not good for you. No. Orange juice, orange juice has fifty times the legal limit of lead that were allowed in wine as an orange juice. But because citrus absorbs heavy metals, it's an orange juice. They warn children under the age of seven not to drink orange juice because you can't flush it from your kidneys. So, don't. It's, it's about everything in moderation. I mean, chocolate's like 500 times the legal limit. Chocolate's crazy in terms of lead and, and iron and copper. But, people, but because people think that orange juice is a natural, no, it's not a natural product. <laughs> so that's the problem with organics. So should we, should we um, give our kids a little Oakville for orange juice? <laughs> yeah. Yes, Scott. Perfect. Adam, boy. Scott. And on that note, I'm going to turn the recording off. So that we can get <laughs> Thank you so 